Well, good morning. This is Rich Morrison, and welcome to this month's Aftermath. Uh, thanks for those that have joined online and here in person. And uh, we'll dig into talking about the markets and a lot more here uh, in the next uh, several minutes. So we'll start out talking about the reports yesterday. Uh, yesterday, we had two different crop reports. We had CONAB, which is the Brazilian government, out with its numbers. And then we had USDA out with its monthly report. And I tend to lean more towards the CONAB numbers than I do USDA uh, because, you know, quite frankly, USDA has a hard time estimating crops in the United States. I don't know how much weight you put on their estimates out of South America. Uh, also, CONAB actually does field surveys here for their February report. So these should be uh, as close to accurate as you're going to get. And you can see the numbers here uh, that they came out with yesterday morning. Most of the focus is on soybean production. Uh, Conab had the, uh, and actually she's got January, but it should be February here uh, on the on the left column. Uh, they had soybean production at 149.4 million metric tons, uh, down about 6 million from last month and down about uh, 5 million from last year's record high. So uh, that was kind of in line with a lot of the trade estimates. Uh, we've seen several private analysts, 145 to low 150s over the last several days. So a sub-150 crop, I, I think that that's probably in line with where we think the crop's going to be. Uh, it's not going to be the 110 uh, that some people were talking about early on uh, when, when we started with a drought and things looked pretty bad. Uh, it's not going to be the 165 either that uh, that a lot of people were saying with, with record acres this year. So, uh, But that's still going to be a big number. We'll look at that here in a minute. Uh, corn production, they also dropped their corn uh, production corn yield number to 113.7. Uh, that is significant because they uh, recognize that uh, uh, some maybe issues with uh, that's going to cause less corn acres to get planted on the second crop. Uh, and that's uh, where the cut came from there. Mm -hmm. Looking at the U.S. numbers, uh, and again, we'll dig into these in a little bit. USDA raised its corn carryout uh, here in the United States, raised bean carryout, 35 million bushels. Uh, took wheat up 10 million bushels. At the world level, though, corn stocks down a little bit, bean stocks up, and wheat stocks down a little bit from last month. I still think the biggest topic we've got uh, this year and probably the biggest story uh, in 2024 is what are the hedge funds going to mm -hmm. do in the ag markets? And we've talked about this every month, but this is a fantastic chart from Peak Trading that really shows what these hedge funds have done over the last two years in the ag markets. And you go back to two years ago when a lot of our markets were making our highs. Now, keep in mind this chart includes the grains, the meats, cotton, sugar, coffee, and cocoa all combined. But two years ago at this time, these hedge funds were long 800,000 contracts in the ag markets. And we had highs in several markets at that time. Uh, you can see how that net has changed over the last two years. Uh, the red were reasons that they sold. The green were reasons that they bought. But as of last Friday, these folks are now short more than 600,000 contracts in the ag markets. And so to me, this explains exactly why the markets have done what they've done. Now, there's fundamental reasons for it, but certainly they're the ones that are carrying the big stick here. And so I keep telling folks, if you're, if you're a pessimist in this business, you look at that and say, woe is us. Nobody likes ag anymore as an investment. Uh, if you're an optimist, you'd look and say, yeah, but how much worse can can it get? And if something changes, they got 609,000 contracts to buy to get back to zero. And so which side of the fence are you on? I think in, you know, in farming, most of us tend to be optimists because uh, we put a crop in the ground every spring. So uh, we'll see what happens this year. But I do think this is the story here uh, for 2024. And one reason for some optimism might be the comparison in ag versus the equity markets. And if you look at the spread, and again, this is a great chart from peak trading, uh, you know, the spread, we're right back down to where we were back in 2021 uh, with equities holding such a huge premium over uh, over the ag markets. And, you know, back then, I, I think it was a point where, and, and think, think about it this way, if you're a hedge fund trader, you make money by buying low and selling high. And well, with this spread right now going back to where it's at, and you got the S and P at five thousand, and several of our stock indexes at all time highs, 
you know, you would think that it might be a, a, a wise trade or a wise spread trade to be shorting stocks and buying commodities. And maybe that'll happen at some point this year. Maybe today is not the day, but but certainly you would think that it's lined up for that to happen at some point. So we'll start out looking at soybeans. Uh, looking at the report yesterday, USDA made one change. They lowered exports 35 million bushels. Uh, that was significant. Took it down to 1720. Uh, so you can see where we've been versus the last three years. Uh, you know, this is what has to change in order to get us back on track. We're down a half a billion bushels from where we were uh, just three years ago. And ending stocks at one point here, just about three months back, were 220 million. We've added almost 100 million to the ending stock number uh, now at 315. And so we just continue to add insult to injury to the bean market, it seems like, uh, since about the middle of December when the rain started hitting uh, up into central Brazil. USDA also lowered the average farm price a dime to 1265 in yesterday's report. Now, again, the positive in this is the crush, 2.3 billion bushels. That's going to continue to rise each year over the next two to three years as we get more and more soy crushing facilities come online. Uh, but it's this export number that we're struggling with. And it it's because of the high prices we had last year for U.S. beans. It's because of the competition from Brazil. And it's due to some problems coming out of China. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Now, you look at South American production overall. These are USDA's numbers in the second column from the right. And so they came out with a 156 number for Brazil yesterday. I think they're at the top end of the trade estimates. Uh, they've got the Argentine crop in blue at 50 million tons. So combined, easily a new record production number. Uh, the column on the far right, those are my numbers. I plugged in 145 for Brazil. I plugged in 52 for Argentina. Uh, one of the firms that I follow in Argentina, they bumped their number up. I'm going with their number, but I dropped my Brazilian number uh, kind of down to the low end of some of the estimates, just to say what if. And so even looking at these two numbers, you're still easily looking at a record production in the Southern Hemisphere. And, and that's what's really discouraging for the bean market right now. And early on, the bulls, you know, back in October, November, when we were rallying beans, we were talking this Brazilian crop to 120, 110, you know, something like that. That's why the bean market really rallied hard in October, November. But again, since the weather changed uh, down there, and it looks like it's at least put a floor into this bean crop, that's what we're dealing with. Now, it has been a tale of two crops. Uh, and again, the reason we're down 20 million or 15 million off of what we thought maybe at the beginning is because of the dry conditions up here in, uh, in central Brazil. Uh, this is the latest greenness map, still shows that they've had some struggles. Uh, so, and, and they're well into harvest now too, which may be part of the reason uh, for some of the brown, but this is comparison to last year. Uh, but the better crops are down south in, in Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, they've had a much, much better growing season this year. So it's kind of flipped uh, versus last year when central Brazil was really, really good. Down south was really, really dry. Uh, looking at the latest five-day forecast uh, from a day or two ago, I guess, uh, still shows Argentina expected to get some pretty good rains. They've been dry and pretty hot over the last seven days. So this is going to be very beneficial to them. Mato Grosso, these countries or the states up north expected to get some pretty good rains as well. Maybe a little drier to the south. If you're a bull, uh, you might be looking at the rain up north saying that it could delay harvest and that it might delay corn planting. Uh, 70, probably closer to 75% of the crop this year, the corn crop is planted following beans. And they're trying to get started up in this part of the world. So Maybe it does limit some corn acres, but Conab had that in their numbers yesterday. And so, you know, I think a lot of that's already in the market. So looking at soybeans uh, at the world level, uh, you look at stocks to usage, 20.5% this year. Uh, that's a five-year high. Uh, back in 2019, you know, you really can't compare. I mean, we had huge, we had record U.S. Uh, ending stocks that year, had big stocks in South America as well. Uh, one of the big factors right now is we're just really seeing China struggle, and that continues to be a big story, I think, in our markets. And this was a headline in the Wall Street Journal last month talking about the Chinese economy limping. Uh, this was a chart that we saw yesterday from Bloomberg. 
showed that China's actually had several months of deflation lately. And their imports are down, their exports are down. If anybody's followed the, the mortgage market in China right now, it's trash. They've built all of this space over there and nobody's buying it. Uh, investors are leaving the country with money, going to Japan, going to the U.S., trying to find a place to invest, at least to hold their cash. So it's just almost been a free-for-all. Mm -hmm. And certainly President uh, Xi, he's been courting U.S. companies to try to come to China and spend money. Hasn't had much success yet. And so this continues to be a, a big, big story. And I'll, I'll mention it a little bit later in another market I look at. But um, but if you look at the prices in China right now, meal, corn, rate meal prices all the way down. Uh, the Chinese government is trying to get farmers actually to cut hog numbers uh, in order to boost hog prices. Uh, that's not a good thing for feed demand. And so, you know, not only the United States, but Brazil, we're all dealing with the same thing here if you're counting on China uh, to be buying soybeans. And if you look at the values of soybeans right now, we don't expect to get much of that market because U.S. beans are in pink, uh, Brazilian beans are in green. These are delivered to China. And so U.S. beans right now for March are trading $2 higher than Brazilian beans delivered to China. So can't see a reason why China would buy U.S. beans. The only reason to be is if harvest gets delayed in Brazil uh, because of wet weather, which we've seen in past years, uh, or uh, quite frankly, they get too many boats lined up, can't get them loaded. You need a quick loading. You'll come to the United States West Coast and maybe load some beans off the West Coast. But part of the problem with U.S. beans this year has been Mississippi River barge freight. Uh, it's been Panama Canal issues with dry weather and and transit times through the canal. So we've just had a a, a plethora of issues this year, it seems like. Uh, and long story short, U.S. beans really priced out of the market right now. So here's the latest fund uh, position in the bean market. Um, again, I'd, I'd point out the purple line. That's when kind of the party started back in 2020 when the funds added their long position, went from 25,000 to 240,000 contracts long in the fall of 2020. Uh, it was a nice run uh, for two to three years. Funds stayed long in the market. Uh, about this time last year, they were still long, almost 200,000 contracts. But then we started harvesting that record South American crop that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, then you started recognizing that U.S. demand was having its issues and the funds liquidated their entire position uh, by the end of May, made a low at that time. Uh, then we got into a U.S. weather market. Funds bought back 100,000 contracts, sold it all off into fall, bought back another 80,000 contracts due to hot, dry Brazilian weather, sold it all off and didn't stop at zero this time. And they've continued to pile onto this market. Uh, mm -hmm. Why would they be comfortable being short right now? Well, you think about it. South America is going to harvest about 7 billion bushels of soybeans. And Brazil's just getting started. So it's kind of like October in the United States. You know, it's just, you know, you're right at the beginning of harvest. And if you think that the market's probably going down, you know, why do you want to get out of your short position right now? Uh, but again, if you're an optimist, you'd look at this and say, well, we've only had one time in history that the funds were shorter and that was back in 2019 when we had record U.S. and record world carryout. So could they continue to sell short? Yeah, they could. Uh, will they? I don't know. I, I think as you get into the back half of South American harvest, especially, you know, I could see a situation where if I'm a hedge fund trader and I'm looking around and me and everybody else are on the same side of the boat, I might be getting a little uncomfortable with that. So I could make a case where you could see a, a short-term rally here in the next 60, 90 days. Maybe not huge, but certainly you could see these people want to even up on their position. That's just my guess. Uh, but based on where they're at today, you know, I would think we would have some limited downside. So here's the March uh, futures market. Uh, again, this was the low we made back at the end of May, 11.45 and a quarter. And I still think that's our potential downside risk in this market. Um, most of us probably forget we got that low. And we rallied three, almost $3 a bushel back to the summer high uh, before things kind of settled down. But we traded within about a dollar or so range for the better part of six months. Uh, this little, These little yellow lines right here, this was a chart gap we left on January 2nd. January 1st, had the markets were closed. 
due to New Year's Day, reopened on on Tuesday morning at 8.30, gap lower from 12.96 to 12.90, and it really hasn't looked back since. Uh, indicators down at the bottom would show that we're pushing oversold right now. We've been there for a while. Uh, I think it's just kind of baby steps right now, but I think that the ultimate target right now is this 20-day moving average line, the blue line. We've traded above the nine day a couple of times, but weren't able to really get much going then. But if you were to get like consecutive closes above this blue line, I, I do think that might trigger some of these hedge funds to say, you know what, maybe now's the time to lighten the load a little bit here. And so can we do that? You know, that's still 20 cents above where the market was at last night. So that to me is the, the real hurdle that we've got short term here. Can you get that done? And if you do, maybe then you get a bounce back to the 50-day moving average up to 1273. Uh, that chart gap at 1290, that seems like that would be a heck of a hill to climb at this point. But, you know, South American weather certainly could be a factor. There's a lot of things that could uh, be a factor here. And, and quite frankly, just hedge funds deciding it's time to do something different. Maybe it's a stock market. You know, if something changes economically that causes people to want to bail out of the stock market, where would they go with their money? Maybe they bring it back to commodities. So, you know, you hate to root against the stock market, but maybe that's where we're at right now with investors that, you know, they want to look at moving some money somewhere else. Looking ahead to new crop, uh, USDA put out its baseline, initial baseline numbers back in October, and they were talking 87, whoops, 87 million acres of beans. I don't think we're going to see that big of a shift. Uh, I think the central corn belt's probably going to be pretty flat as far as acreage shift. I do think around the peripheral, you may see some more bean acres, especially in North Dakota and some areas where we're getting some of these new soybean crushing facilities coming online. Uh, I've used 85 and a half million acres. So depending on what you plug in for yield, you know, you could still have a pretty good, you know, four, five, four, 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 five, four, three, whatever crop this year. Uh, I do think demand should improve. I think this crush number is still going to grow each year uh, with these new plants coming online. A uh, little optimistic that demand's going to come back, although we're going to see a lot of competition still out of Brazil. And, you know, both USDA and myself really not looking for a big jump, if any, in, in stocks in the year ahead. And so the U.S. balance sheet by itself, just standing alone, really isn't that negative. So I still think the, the, the biggest factor for beans is going to be South America. And that's why I think we're expecting lower farm price here uh, in the year ahead. And so looking at November futures, uh, you know, we're already at 1172. Uh, so you take a basis off of that, you're probably below 1150 right now uh, on the November contract or November cash. Uh, again, very similar looking chart. We had a low about 50 cents or so below the market back at the end of May, which I still think is our downside risk. Uh, indicators would show us at least short term being a little bit oversold. Still got a chart gap at 1230 to 1236. I think that would be a heck of a target to be getting some beans priced. And that's right at the 50 day moving average at 1231 as well. So I, I'm probably 12 and a quarter. Uh, if I wanted to make some catch up sales, I'd probably put some offers in uh, at that level. Uh, anybody that purchased margin protection insurance, 1295 looks pretty good right now. Uh, at 95% of that, uh, you know, do quick math, it's about 65 cents mm -hmm. off. 1230 would be roughly where you would be starting to trigger payments. So I, I'm looking at this policy as a 1230 put right now, not knowing what inputs are, or, well, inputs haven't changed a whole lot, not knowing where your county yields are going to land. You know, I'm looking at this at 1230, which is right where that chart gap is. So it looks like a pretty good uh, investment at this point. The last chart on beans, uh, this stocks to use to farm price chart. Um, Again, I call this my Captain Obvious chart when I build it because I knew it was going to show me that when we have tight stocks, we have high price and vice versa. But you can see that stocks have been relatively tight the previous three years, and that's what pushed prices back up to double digits again. This year, with yesterday's change, now we're looking at a 7.5% stocks to usage number. Of course, we're looking at lower price this year. But again, I, I focus back on the decade previous and been talking about this for a couple of years now that, you know, after you make record high prices in 2012, the following year, we saw more bean acres planted in the world and you saw export demand drop. 
and prices went down. And they went down again the following year because we still had to try to get somebody to quit growing some more acres. You know, Brazil planted 3% more acres this year, and that probably wasn't needed. And next year, they're probably going to plant more acres unless the government backs off of its incentive program. So I'm fearful that we could see bean prices continue to trend lower uh, in the year ahead uh, until we seek out a, a better demand base, until you get people to quit expanded bean acres. U.S. bean acres, we're going to plant more this year. Probably don't need to at this point, but probably don't need more cord acres now either. So uh, where, do the, where do the acres go to? I think that's the question going ahead. Uh, looking at corn, yesterday USDA made one little change to the balance sheet, uh, dropped the food, seed, and industrial use 10 million bushels, took ending stocks up 10 million to 2.172 billion. Uh, didn't really need to go that direction, but you can see that's the biggest carryout we've had in five years. We came off of three straight years of tight stocks of corn, and now all of a sudden we flipped this thing from an inverted corn market to a carry corn market almost overnight. Now the market, instead of telling you we want your corn today, the market's trying to get somebody to store it. And I think the biggest challenge the corn market's going to have, uh, futures and basis both, is trying to figure out who's going to store 2.172 billion bushels of corn into next harvest. Somebody's going to have to do it. And I don't think the U.S. farmer probably wants to be the one to do it. So the market's going to have to try to pay elevators to store 2.17 billion bushels of corn. And I think that that's probably one of these stories in the corn market here as we go forward. Now, look back to last year. Two things happened after we had a record, well, a 10 year high in corn price. Number one was this export number. This past year got worse in every crop report we had last year, ended up at 1661 billion bushels, down more than a billion bushels from the high we had back in 2021. We were going to get some of that back this year, but we're not getting it all back. And that's what needs to happen in order to chew through this extra corn. We're going to have to get exports back up, or you're going to have to see significant drop in planted acres, which, again, high price got us to plant, what, 6.4 million more corn acres this past year. So an incredible jump, and in hindsight, probably didn't need to happen. But that's what happened. So looking at the world numbers yesterday, uh, world stocks are up to 9.4% stocks to usage, and that's mainly driven by the U.S. numbers uh, in, the, in the current report and the current gain that we've got this year. Looking at the funds, uh, again, you know, we had two or three years where the funds were holding substantial length, had record length, uh, 400 plus thousand contracts of corn at one point. Last year at this time, they were still long 200,000, the red line. Uh, but it was about this time last year where we were really noticing that we were struggling on export sales and we were talking bigger corn acres getting planted in the spring. And the funds liquidated that entire position in the middle of February. And uh, you can see what they've done the last several months. They've continued to short this corn market. As of last Friday, they're short 280,000 contracts of corn. The only two times they've been shorter, the orange line, that was the spring of COVID after they had everybody sold short everything. And then the year before that, they were short a record 322,000 contracts when we had a big carryout back in 2019. So can they sell lower? Yes, they can. Uh, will they? Um, you know, I think right now it's kind of a waiting game with the U.S. farmer. You know, in beans, it's more South America. In the United States, I think it's, or, it, it, or in corn, it's more of the U.S. farmer holding a lot of stocks. Uh, the December 1 grain stocks report, we were holding 7.1 billion bushels of corn on the farm. Uh, some of that's moved since then, but I'm sure we still have farmer-owned corn and grain elevators, too, that you add to that number. And so I talked to guys yesterday in Iowa that were telling me, I've got corn in the elevator, I'm paying storage on, what should I do? Uh, it's a hard decision right now. Should you sell by a call? Should you... Uh, put it on a basis contract. If you knew the market was going to rally, you'd probably put it on a basis contract. But uh, we don't know that. And I don't know that I want to be in a position of of uh, rolling basis contracts either. Uh, I told Judy last night, we were talking a little bit about this. And I, I said, I think the I think I'd be offering corn against the July board right now. If you had a big chunk of unsold corn, that might be a way to attack this thing. Uh, 
And maybe you find a shipper or a, an ethanol plant that would bite on a big lot. You know, maybe that's what you do to avoid having to roll into that spread. Mm -hmm. But you look at March futures, uh, made a new low yesterday, 429 and three quarters. We're down over $2 off the high. But the indicators, 29 on the RSI, stochastics, well oversold right now. Uh, again, I think it's baby steps. Can you get back above the nine day? Can you get back above the 20 day moving average, the blue line? which we haven't done since early December. And if you do that, I do think maybe you see some, some funds decide to even up some of their position. And maybe you bounce back to the 50-day at 463. I think the 100-day, that's been my goal for a while. That looks like a big stretch at this point. Uh, but again, the market structure in corn is completely flipped. Instead of looking at an inverted market now, we're looking at a carry market. Uh, the spread to from March to July, I think it's right around 22, 23 cents. So the market's trying to pay you five and a half cents a month to store corn. Uh, I know every country elevator manager I've talked to filled up with corn this fall, hedged it in the July contract at a 30 to 45 cent spread, depending on when you did it. So there's been big, big carries in the market. And I expect that to continue. A again, somebody has to be incented to hold corn in the fall. I think the July, September is probably going to widen out to at least 12 cents, uh, maybe more. I think the September to December, you're going to get at least 18, maybe 20 cents out of that spread. So I, I think that that's what's got to happen to give someone the incentive to store this corn, which is good if you have extra bin space because your bins are now uh, paying for themselves. It's bad if you have to move the crop because, you know, this front end is just, where, where the pain is 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 taking place. And so if you get a rally and you have the ability to store it until summer, you know, I want to watch the July contract if possible. Uh, try to be selling cash out June, July or sell futures and lock the basis in later, uh, maybe early summer. I do think that late summer could get kind of mean uh, if farmers are still sitting on a lot of crop come late July, August and decide it's time to empty the bins. Uh, it, it could, you know, you could see some big, big pressure and basis in a lot of areas. And so I probably want to avoid that window if possible. Looking ahead to new crop uh, acres, I, I think we're going to see a dip in acres, uh, maybe not a huge drop. USDA saying 91 million. I'm using 92. Uh, I do think the peripheral of the Corn Belt will probably see a few less corn acres, but I do think the central part uh, and what I'm hearing across Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, uh, so far, guys got a lot of field work done this fall, got a lot of nitrogen put on. So doesn't sound like we're planning on cutting back on corn acres a lot. Uh, depending on what you plug in for a trend line yield, both USDA and myself plugging in 15 billion bushels. I do think overall demand is going to improve some, but, you know, the feed numbers, you can only, you know, cattle numbers, you probably read the stories that, you know, the lowest number since 1951 on feed you're not going to build that herd back up quickly. Hog poultry numbers, you know, a little bit of growth there, but not a lot. Ethanol, 5.4 billion is about maxed out. You really can't get bigger than that. If you're going to chew through the bushels, it's going to have to be in the export number and probably means you'd have to have lower price and or you got to get China back in the market. And that's going to be difficult to do. I do think we could see a little bit of a bump there, but both USDA, myself, right now showing a bigger stock number at the end of next year. So unless you get corn acres down into the 80s, it looks to me like a pretty good likelihood that you would see stocks to grow again this year and probably see lower farm price. Um, they're saying 450 corn, I plugged in four and a quarter. And if you look at the chart today, you know, you take a national basis, roughly 20, 25 under, you're below 4, 450 right now. So, uh, you know, can it go lower than this? Uh, sure. If you're looking at two, four or two, five, two, six crop or stock number, you're probably going to looking at a lower price. Short term, you know, the RSI at 31, stochastics are at least negative at the moment, but short term, again, can you get back above the nine and the 20 day moving averages? And if so, you know, I think you do set as a stage for maybe a bump back up to 490 to $5 corn. And I'd probably want to be getting all over that. Uh, the nice thing about December is the carry. You know, you're at least benefiting from a 40 cent higher price for December corn than we have for March right now. So if you're marketing new crop corn and whether you're a farmer, whether you're an elevator, even elevators probably ought to be hedging out the December right now. If you got the space, and that's why I asked the group here if, you know, the, the elevator here in town had their hoop building full because they should. 
you know, they should be carrying corn right now. And for 40 cents a bushel for six, eight or eight months or whatever, there's pretty good money to be made. So uh, I, I would think ownership is, is good in corn. Um, again, four ninety to five dollars. We had a gap at five oh two. You know, I think there'd be a bunch of areas up here. I'd want to be a looking to make some sales. Uh, B, I like the min max type program this year. I wrote about it maybe a little over a month ago, uh, buying puts and selling calls. Because if we got to carry out a 2 billion bushels, I don't really see the upside potential necessarily. Uh, back then, we were looking at buying $5 puts and selling 560 or 580 calls. I'd probably temper that right now to maybe 480 puts and 520, 530, 540 calls. If I can set a floor and take a ceiling, maybe that's a good way to attack the market this year. Uh, I also want to look at ECO for the farmers that didn't buy margin protection insurance. ECO to me is like a put option. It is a revenue-based product, but it acts like a put to me, depending on what your county yield does. And so we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, and I'll talk about margin protection here in a little bit, but it looks like a pretty good deal at the 509 price right now. Lastly, on corn, you know, looking at stocks to use to price, uh, 14.9% stocks to use uh, sticks out kind of like a sore thumb right now. The last time we were at that level back in the last decade when we had sharply lower prices. So again, I don't think this number equates to 480 corn. I, you know, I think corn price needs to be lower given that type of a number. And if we're thinking stocks to use could rise in the year ahead, you know, once again, I look back at the last decade and this is very familiar, you know, where you made highs, the following year, you saw export demand drop, you saw acres increase, and prices went down for a couple of years. And I would tend to lean towards, you know, a year down the road being below where we're at today. Wheat, uh, USDA made one small change. They dropped the food use 10 million bushels, raised ending stocks 10 million yesterday, kept average farm price the same at 720. But again, the thing to point out here in wheat is we're seeing a higher ending stock number in the United States for the first time in five years. And so the, the trend has kind of changed. And if you look at the U.S. number here in red and the world, you know, world stocks of wheat continue to kind of tighten up a little bit. And so if there's any optimism right now in the wheat market, to me, the biggest optimism is somebody in the world has a bit of a crop problem and their stocks tighten and you see some demand come to the United States. The other reason for maybe a little optimism would be some world problems right now. You've got the war in the, in the Red Sea. You've got the war in the Black Sea right now. And so, you know, is there potential for this wheat market to flip around? Uh, we did see a rally in wheat back in December for, didn't last very long, but uh, because of the traffic having to go around the Red Sea, uh, you're taking wheat to Egypt and you had to run around the horn back through the Mediterranean uh, to get to Egypt. And that might bring U.S. wheat a little more competitive with Australia and some other uh, countries that are shipping over there. So maybe something like that gets the market kickstarted. Looking ahead to this year, USDA's baseline numbers, uh, they showed acres down, but they show yield up. That would be in hard red winter wheat country, expected to bounce back this year. Uh, they're showing a higher production and a higher ending stock number with a lower farm price in the year ahead. Uh, by the way, I didn't show it this month. I had it in last month, but the winter wheat seedings numbers were down in just about every state in the union this year. The exception was where we had some pretty good crops in Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. They actually showed wheat seedings being up slightly uh, versus a year ago. Now, here's a snapshot of the fund position. This is a couple of weeks ago, but uh, the fund position in soft red winter wheat. And if there's hope for the corn market and the bean market, I think you take that hope from this chart right here. Uh, back at December the 1st, this is when China came in and bought soft red winter wheat from the United States. Five straight days they bought wheat. And the funds bought back 60,000 contracts a wheat just in that period of time. So it does show what can happen. Not predicting it, but if something unusual happens, these funds are so short, these markets right now, that they do have plenty of buying power. And so, yes, they're still short wheat, but that buying spree accounted for about an 80 cent move in the soft red winter wheat market. You look back to late November to the early part of December, we rallied wheat 80 cents. And so if you're all sitting here along a bunch of bushels of corn, beans, whatever the case is, to me, that's our hope that something triggers these people to buy back part of that short position right now. Uh, 
Looking at soft red wheat for July, we, you know, we're kind of back down testing this 593 level. Uh, the indicators are kind of pointing lower. Um, again, kind of like the other markets, can we get back above the nine and the 20 day moving average? Hold that. And if it does, maybe it triggers a little buying. Uh, but the wheat market has kind of flattened out here over the last three to four months, not quite as much pressure out of South America like we're seeing in corn and beans. Uh, if you bought revenue insurance at 661, uh, looks pretty decent right now, uh, depending on what coverage level you've got. Uh, I would probably still look at the 100 and the 50 day moving average around six and a quarter as a pretty good start uh, for marketing uh, if you get a bounce back. Looking at Kansas City wheat, uh, again, actually this market well below or bigger drop relative to the base price. Uh, we did see that demand in soft red wheat. We haven't seen any demand in hard wheat. And so soft wheat, Chicago wheat, has held up better uh, than the Kansas City market. And so it's gone down and made a new low here this week. Uh, but again, as far as targets go, I'd probably look at the 100-day moving average, the purple line at 656. Uh, originally, that uh, well, a month ago, that was right back up around 680 where these recent highs were at, but it's continued to trend lower. So a bounce back of about 50 cents, I think would be a good target uh, to be making some sales. Spring wheat, Flirting with the the July uh, or excuse me the January contract low uh, indicators pointing down right at the moment. I think it's going to probably follow the corn market here short term. But again, can you get back above these moving averages and and trigger some buying? Uh, right now, funds are record short Minneapolis wheat. It's not a big position. It's about thirty thousand contracts, but it is significant in that market because there's not a lot traded. Uh, Seven thirty, the one hundred day moving average, probably be a good target to be making some sales. Uh, looking at new crop wheat, made a new low yesterday. I think we're anticipating maybe a little bit of a bounce in spring wheat acres up north, maybe in lieu of less corn. And so that's probably what's driving this market. Uh, the margin protection policy looks pretty good at 8.05 right now, since we're down below seven bucks. Uh, I would probably look at the 50 day as a starting point at 734 and then the 100 day at 755. Probably look at those two lines as some pricing targets on a rebound. But this market way oversold. You see the stochastics down here into single digits. Probably tells me this market's probably closer to a low than a high. Finally, cotton. Uh, if you want to talk about a good market, this would be it right now. Uh, the cotton market has waited a long time to make its move and finally started, but we've had lower production numbers several months in a row. This month, USDA no longer changing production. Uh, they did lower domestic use, but for the first time in a long, long time, they actually raised the export number. And so that lowered ending stocks, uh, 100,000 bales to 2.8 million bales, took the average farm price up a penny to 77 cents. So all of a sudden, you know, that little bit of optimism in the export number from USDA is, is giving some life to this market. And if you look at U.S. stocks to usage, world stocks to use, you know, even though this world number is huge, at least it's trending lower. And the U.S. number in particular, trending a lot lower this year from 29 to 21%. And so funds uh, have added some length in cotton. The blue line here shows their net position right now. And as of a week ago, they're back to long 26,000 contracts. And I, I would suggest that if uh, if uh, this continues, that maybe cotton might try to buy a few acres this year. Uh, you look at the March contract right now, pushing back up near uh, 90 cents, uh, well overbought at the moment, RSI at 78, stochastics well up into the 90s. This thing's very toppy and it really sticks out like a sore thumb, probably the target right up here at 90.29 cents. So uh, I would think I'd want to be liquidating any old crop cotton stocks right now on this rally. Uh, looking ahead to new crop, uh, the baseline numbers from USDA, now they were saying 11.7 million acres back in October, and I don't know what the basis of that was. Uh, I've talked to several folks uh, in cotton country, and they've all told me no, uh, ten about unchanged is what they were expecting. Mm -hmm. That said, with this recent rally, maybe USDA will end up being right. Maybe we will take some acres that maybe we're going to switch to soybeans. Maybe they'll come back to cotton this year. Uh, and so maybe that'll affect some acres in the Delta, uh, maybe a few acres that we're going to go to sorghum or something in Texas, irrigated corn may switch over to cotton as well. So looking at the December contract, I had to widen my chart 
clear out back to last year in January when the last time we traded cotton higher than we are today. And that was at 83.4 cents. Now, not a huge number, not a, a very profitable number, but it's a lot better than 76, 77 cents that we had just been down to. So uh, I, I do think it can add a few acres. I do think you want to be hedging this market right now or uh, the min-max strategy again in cotton. I like uh, buy puts, sell calls. You know, if I can buy 81, 82 cent puts, maybe sell an 85 cent call to help pay for that. I think that's not a bad strategy. Set a floor into this market in case acres do go up. Uh, I'm willing to take a ceiling at 85. I think that would be a good target as well. But you got the RSI pushing 79, stochastics in the upper 90s. This market is very, very, very due for a correction. And again, we're just within a half cent of the high that we made uh, clear back in January a year ago. So uh, can it buy acres? Yeah. And that's another reason why you'd want to be defending prices right now. So switching over, uh, I normally don't look at a lot of other markets, but I, there are several really wild markets trading right now. Uh, first off, the negative is we talked about container ships a little bit ago. Maersk, uh, the shipping company, their stock is getting hammered right now. Uh, this is today's trade only, So, uh, but you can see what's happening here. They're uh, crashing and burning literally. And uh, not only is uh, has the uh, attacks on the shipping in the Red Sea caused problems, but uh, somebody wrote uh, that they thought it's it's also going to cause a stack up of containers. They're all going to be in one area of the of the world, and so it, it's just causing their logistics to get really really messed up. Uh, the big mover to the upside is Nvidia, and I don't know how many people are watching Nvidia stock all time high again. I read this morning that the value of NVIDIA is higher than the value of the Chinese stock market total right now, which seems hard to believe. It's a, what, a chip company, a, a tech company, but, you know, how that can be the case is just incredible right now. And so NVIDIA stock continues to soar. Uh, the cocoa market. Uh, now, when I included that, that chart earlier showing the fund position in ag, that was also including cocoa. So... Funds are long cocoa right now. The market's making an all-time high in cocoa. So if you're thinking about having chocolate for Valentine's Day, you might want to get ahead of it and get uh, get your present bought up, I guess, because chocolate prices may be going higher. The U.S. dollar, uh, it's not a record high by any means, but we are four points off the low that we made at the end of the year. Uh, that's not a good thing for us in ag if we're counting on export business. And uh, the dollar seems to be a kind of a safe haven. Uh, certainly for those that don't want to put money in the stock market, this seems to be the area uh, where they might be placing it right now. And compared to other currencies around the world, you know, I, I guess people still believe in the dollar compared to some of the other currencies. Uh, the cattle market. Uh, I took this snapshot the other morning on Fox News. They were interviewing a uh, probably the only cattle farmer in Sandwich, <laughs> Illinois. Uh, they had to send the Fox News team out of Chicago, and that was the first guy they found. But the point is, uh, talking about cattle shortages, and you look at the cattle market, and you know, back in December, we had a lot of people asking the question, or November, why is this cattle market breaking? And I think back then, and we talked about it a couple of months back, that uh, it was the funds. Funds had gone taking their long position back in September, they were long over 100,000 contracts of cattle and took it down to 10,000 long by the 1st of December. It was fund liquidation. They were liquidating commodities in general. But I think as you start looking at the fundamentals, the fundamentals still were supportive to the cattle market. And so they you started seeing some buying back in this market. Now you've taken live cattle back to 187. Uh, Again, very overbought right now. The RSI at 72, stochastics up in the 90s, uh, probably tells me that now's a good time to be maybe making some sales. Uh, I didn't mark it, but there's a chart gap right back up here uh, that was left a little below 190. And uh, I think if you get back to that neighborhood, that's probably a, a good sale uh, target. Same with feeders. Uh, feeders did fill their chart gap from back in October and have trended a little higher still. Uh, I would probably watch the nine-day moving average as long as we can hold that, uh, which right now it's just about $250. You know, maybe this market can continue to climb a little bit. But if we break back below it, probably a sell signal. 
And so the RSI at 75 stochastics right now would tell you probably worth defending price as well. So either A, hedges, B, buy and puts, uh, or C, we do have a product called livestock risk protection. Uh, this is a federal crop insurance product. The nice thing about livestock risk protection, it's like a put option, but the government subsidizes about half the cost of it. So it's a subsidized put. Now, the difference between this and a put, in a put option, you can sell back out of it. You can trade in and, in and out of them. Uh, LRP, you can't. You have to write it. So it, it, But it's really good for setting a floor. And if you want to lock in a floor, uh, take a look at this product. Now, timing is a little bit of an issue on it. Uh, they set the prices late afternoon. You have to make a decision, I think, by 825 in the morning, whether you want to buy it. So it's kind of an overnight, late afternoon, early morning type product. But I would encourage you to take a look at it. If you got cattle and you want to look at locking in a floor, to me, this is a pretty good product. And we've seen the demand for this product soar over the last couple of years uh, in the crop insurance business. A uh, lot more interest. Uh, I've talked to several brokers now that are got their crop insurance license so they can sell LRP insurance instead of selling puts. So it's it's becoming a big deal mainly because of the subsidy that's included in the product. Uh, another big market right now, the S&P. I mentioned earlier, we've topped 5,000. Somebody said the S&P 500 ought to be the S&P 5,000 now because of well, of how high it's running. And, you know, this seems, uh, you know, the stock market in itself over time is always a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that you, you just get more, you know, anybody who's investing every other week uh, in their paycheck or whatever the case always puts money in the stock market. And so stocks tend to climb over time. Doesn't mean you don't get corrections. Doesn't mean we shouldn't get corrections. And I think that, you know, if you're looking at a hedge fund trading situation, you know, if you look at the RSI at 73 and the stochastics 98, 96 right now, if I'm a hedge fund trader, I'd be a little nervous being long stocks, just as I'm nervous being maybe that short uh, corn and soybeans. And so I think, you know, a month from now wouldn't shock me at all to have made a bit of a correction in both of these markets, maybe to see the stock market correct back a little bit, maybe see corn beans correct up a little bit. So switching gears, talking about the government program election. Um, everybody knows by now that the Congress extended the current farm program another year. So once again, we have to elect between PLC and ARC at the FSA office by March 15. Uh, the same message this year as last year is that the biggest thing you have to decide is if I'm buying SCO or not buying SCO. SCO is supplemental coverage option. It's a crop insurance add-on that covers from your level of coverage, individual coverage, up to 86%, covers that next band. Uh, if I decide to buy SCO, I cannot sign up for ARC because they're both very similar. The government won't let you do both. Both are 86% county level triggers. So to me, the only decision relative to the farm program this year for most crops is do I buy SCO? And if I do, I have to sign up for PLC. If I don't, I will sign up for the ARC program. And this is a letter that we've been sending out for a month and a half now. We'll continue to update with the updated prices. But kind of did explain the decision again this year. PLC in its current situation uses the numbers in the blue box. And these numbers are not very strong right now. These are our reference prices for PLC. PLC is price loss. And at the end of the year, if the market year average price ends up below the numbers in the blue, you would get paid the difference times your payment yield at FSA times 80, uh, 85% of your base acres. Keep in mind that PLC and the ARC programs pay on 85% of your base acres. So you may want to look at what your base is just so you know whether you got some protection on that farm. If you got a corn base or not and you intend to plant corn, that might be a big deal. Uh, these in, in the gray box, these are this year's market your average prices. We knew a year ago at sign-up time that PLC looked worthless by itself. We're not going to go to 401, 926, 550, seed cotton at 3670. Peanuts and rice aren't even low enough right now to trigger PLC money and don't look like they're going to be next year as well. So PLC, again, not a good program as it sits today. Congress is talking about trying to raise these reference prices in the next farm bill. 
Uh, the problem with that is, is dollars and the Congressional Budget Office, when they plugged in numbers like four and a quarter corn, take that times every bushel of corn in the United States. And all of a sudden, the CBO thinks it could cost a, billions of dollars to to raise that reference price. And so how are you going to pay for it? And that's all the stuff that Congress is dealing with. And I don't even want to get into it today. Probably not why we're why we're not going to get a farm bill again this year. But last year, the decision came down to SCO versus ARC. ARC uses the numbers in the red box. And these were this past year's ARC numbers. Five-year Olympic average on corn was 398, beans at 957, wheat at 550. We take for the ARC program that five-year Olympic average price times your county's five-year Olympic average yield times 85% to come up with your ARC county trigger. SCO used the crop insurance price a year ago, and it was extremely attractive at 591 and 1376. Take that times the crop insurance county yield times 86%. And we had such an advantage on corn, $2, beans over four, that on those crops, SCO made sense. And we saw it in the oil seed markets up north and several other markets where a lot of farmers bought SCO coverage last year because of the uh, additional dollars we could get over what we could do in the ARC program. This year, it's changing because what's happening in the ARC program, again, it's a five-year Olympic average price. So we're dropping off 2017's price and we're bringing in 2022 to the equation. So corn's going to gain almost 90 cents. Beans are going to gain a buck 60. Whereas the crop insurance price in green is all going to be lower. Those are prices being set right now in the month of February. Actually, we're, I think, at 477 and 1176 here this morning for most states. So today, I would favor the ARC program for corn uh, versus buy an SEO. And so if you're buying, say, 75, 80%, whatever the case is, and we've done SCO maybe in the past year, uh, I would probably look at the ARC program to cover that next band of dollars above. For soybeans, uh, take a look at your situation. Do I have bean base on the farm? That matters if I decided to sign up for ARC. Uh, or do I not? Do I plant a lot of acres of beans? Do I not? You know, to me, that's the decision you got to make here. Uh, do, does SCO make sense? Does it have enough of an advantage over ARC that it makes sense to buy it? And I think that's where you need to sit down and look at your situation, look at your base acres, look at what I'm going to plan on a farm. Does it make sense to buy SCO or does it make sense just to sign up for the ARC program? Same with wheat, uh, depending on where you're at. Uh, cotton has its own program called Stacks, which I still would favor versus signing up for the ARC program. Uh, because ARC uses a multi-year, or the, the, the market year average price. Stax is going to use the spring price compared to the fall price. So I do think that there's reasons I would still look at the Stax program for cotton. But sorghum, probably look at ARC. Uh, and you can see some of the other the feed grain crops probably look at the ARC program as well. Rice, probably look back at the crop insurance, especially SCO, because the rice price, a lot higher than what we're looking at at ARC. I would sign up for PLC by SCO on rice. Hopefully that helps you with that decision. I don't think it's a hard decision this year. ARC certainly coming into play, especially in the feed grains. Other crops probably still look at SCO. Uh, additional coverages to look at. Uh, margin protection insurance, those prices, that's all under the bridge now. That was set last fall. Uh, but I did want to show you an update on how that policy looked as of last night. Uh, this was an example using our uh, indemnity worksheet uh, that I used in Macoupin County, Illinois. Uh, looking at input prices, you know, it's really fascinating to me that all of these inputs have changed quite a bit. Urea is down, DAP is up, uh, diesel's down, interest is down slightly. But when you look at the difference in expected cost to final cost overall, it's within pennies right now. Uh, first time that's happened in a long, long time that we didn't get any change in the inputs. So if the county yield were to stay unchanged because of the drop in the price from 509 to 472, currently would be triggered about a $27 payment. And you can see how in the matrix down below, you know, if we were to go down to say 428 this fall with an unchanged county yield, you know, now you're up to 131 bucks. If the price go or if the yield goes up 5%, you're still looking at $81. So to me, it's like an at the money or an in the money put option at the moment. Soybeans uh, have actually had a bigger price drop. Uh, input prices up just slightly. But because beans are down over a dollar so far, 
Uh, now we're looking at an indemnity of $44 an acre if the county yield comes in unchanged. And you can see, again, if you look down, you know, if you think beans are going down into the $11 range, you know, you could be looking at a significant payment there. So we'll continue to monitor this as we go forward. We'll start setting the final input prices in the month of April. Uh, so that's just uh, about, what, six weeks away when we'll start doing that. We also have SCO and ECO this year. Uh, last year, we looked at SCO and ECO, these county add-ons. We talked about SCO a minute ago. It starts at your individual coverage and goes up to 86%. ECO starts at 86 and goes to 90 or 95. Last year, we looked at these as a way to lock in a profit margin using 591 and 1372 or whatever the bean price was. This year, I'm looking at them as ways to try to cover your cost of production. And again, you know, we, we kind of talked about SCO and ARC a minute ago, but this is how these all stack together. The blue part of this is your individual coverage that you buy on your farm. And a lot of guys are buying 75, 80, maybe 85% in some areas. The next level above this is this gold band is the decision. It's an either or. I could buy SEO or I could sign up for the ARC program. And that's where you have to make that decision. Does it make sense for SEO or ARC? As I mentioned on corn, I think I signed up for ARC on beans maybe SEO, rice, some of the other crops, probably look at the SEO program. But ECO, you can do it independently of your farm program decision. So that goes from 86 to 90 or 86 to 95. So I could have signed up for the ARC program on corn, bought my individual policy, still add ECO coverage up to 90 or 95%. Okay. And again, uh, I look at ECO and I've looked at margin protection as well, kind of like a put option at 95% of my expected county, using 95% of my expected county yield, but also 95% of the base price. If I think price could go down 10% this year, then using this coverage subsidized by the government makes some sense to me. And so this was a, the producer profitability matrix that we built last year uh, to be able to show you how uh, adding SEO and ECO along with your expenses, putting in bushels per acre forward sold, how it all kind of fits together to show profitability. And so we've got expenses in the red on the right. We've got forward sales uh, in the green down below. And then we've got your insurance on the left-hand side, your county and individual yields, my policy that I bought, did I buy SCO and ECO? Now, this was an example that I ran for just a, a fictitious corn farm, $1,000 expenses per acre. I know everybody's numbers are going to be different than that. Uh, didn't forward sell any corn, bought an 80% RP policy, didn't do anything else. And if you look at the matrix down below, we've got yields across the top and prices down the left-hand side. And it did show that this producer, if he had a 200 bushel APH, grew a yield right at that number and the crop stayed at, or the price stayed at 591, he was going to make 158 bucks an acre after he paid for his 80% policy. But it, price ended up at 488. And so in this particular instance, we end up down $48 an acre. And so that was the risk we had last year. And certainly we looked at some reason, some ways to go ahead and manage that. One was adding SCO from 80 to 86%. It didn't make money in all instances, but at least it stopped the downside. A lot of us looked at ECO this past year to be able to take advantage of that 591 price at 95%. And now it guaranteed that we weren't going to lose money this year. And so we haven't had a lot of those in the last, you know, 10 plus years. So it was nice to be able to have tools to be able to lock in profitability. And that was even after we doubled the cost of our insurance to add the ECO. Uh, a lot of us looked at forward selling last year. We talked about forward selling a big chunk of the crop. And if I forward sold 40%, you know, now I'm really looking at a good situation, even with a lower price. And so that was last year. We had some good opportunities to be able to manage that risk. Uh, this year, we are currently setting prices uh, for insurance. Uh, these are our southern states. Uh, so the Mid-South, South, south uh, we're just a few days away from finalizing these numbers. You can see corn 477, uh, Louisiana corn 469. It uses a September contract. Cotton at 81 cents, beans 1189, uh, 1198 in, in the Carolinas. Uh, throughout most of the other states, these are our prices five or six days in, 476 on corn. We're down a buck 15 from last year. Soybeans down exactly $2 a bushel 
uh, from last year. You can see some of the other numbers as well. So trying to build a plan for this year, of course, is going to be more challenging. Uh, hopefully our input prices may be down a little bit, but this is the same plan that I ended up with at the end of last year, and it doesn't look as good right now. And, and so what changes do we need to make? Uh, I do think at this point, we probably need to be a little more creative. I wouldn't sell 40% of my crop today at the current market. You know, maybe I take that off and I put my offers in 20 cents up. If we able to get some of those prices locked in, I want to do that. Uh, on corn, maybe I don't buy the SCO this year. I use the ARC program to manage that gold part, that middle part of my uh, coverage. Uh, and so that saves me a few dollars on that crop insurance. Uh, on ECO, this year, last year, a lot of people bought 95% to have the high trigger, but bought the 50% election on the dollars of coverage. Now, the way that works is it, you could still trigger a payment at, 95, at a 5% loss in the county, but if there's a $100 payment, I get paid $50, $50 an acre. But I also only paid 50% of my commission or uh, of my uh, um, premium. Thank you. Pay 50% of the premium. So I save half the cost, I get paid half. Now, as a marketing guy, I like to look at this, as I mentioned, as a put option. And so instead of looking at it as I'm getting paid 50 cents on the dollar, I look at it as if I'm uh, getting paid on 50% of my acres. So I'm if I do the 95.50, I'm doing basically 100% on half my acres. And I think that makes sense to me as if I'm buying a put on half my ground. Uh, that way, if I forward sell maybe the other 40 or 50% on a rally, then I've got a plan in place. I've got this ECO put over here. I've got my marketing over here. Um, maybe that allows me to be able to lock in some profitable numbers here for this year. But again, I do think we have to be a little more creative this year. And so that was kind of my plan. You know, work offers to hedge above the market on new crop, maybe 40%, maybe up to half. Uh, on corn, maybe beans, you consider signing up for the ARC program and not doing SCO and use the ECO as a put option. Uh, if you're adamant that prices are going to go sharply lower, you know, then certainly you'd want to buy the 100%. If you're not, but you still want to have a trigger on some, maybe buy that price part down. So this is how we manage it this year. Decide, make your decisions. Uh, we got about five weeks to go. So now's the time to be, first of all, deciding on SCO. That'll help you decide at the FSA office and then go from there. Does ECO make sense this year as well? So coming up now through the end of the month, uh, most states will be setting their base prices. Uh, February 19th, President's Day, markets will be closed that day. Uh, the third week of February, uh, we'll get a lot of numbers that week. Uh, for anybody that bought a county insurance policy last year, we'll be kind of curious to see what NAS state reports look like for last year. Now, these are not the numbers we use for crop insurance, uh, but they will put out the first county numbers for this past year. And it'll at least give us an estimate, I think, between, you know, three to four acre or three to four bushel an acre within of whether or not there might be some potential losses this year. So we'll be looking for those numbers when NAS puts their county reports out. Also, uh, the Ag Outlook Forum meets in Washington, D.C. that week. Uh, they'll put out their new baseline projections, and uh, we'll be kind of curious to see if they update their acreage numbers. March 8th, we'll have our next WASDE report, USDA. Probably get updated South American yields, maybe some updated balance sheet numbers in the U.S. March 11th, it happens to be on a Monday, we'll be hosting this month's aftermath. So we'll talk all about it uh, then. Uh, March 15 is our sales closing date for most states. Uh, southern states are the end of this month, but the 15th uh, for sales closing for crop insurance, also at the FSA office. And then March 31 is our planning intentions report, which will include USDA's first numbers based on producer surveys. So maybe you'll be asked to fill out a survey for USDA. Also want to mention our marketing cards for this year. And if you have, uh, if you're not getting the opening bell phone call or the email in the afternoon, uh, you're welcome to sign up. Please shoot me a note. We'll be happy to get you added to those. So not seeing any questions. Uh, certainly thank everybody for joining this month. Uh, hope you have a successful uh, month ahead. Hope you have a good rest of your winter and we will talk to you all again very, very soon. Thanks for listening to this month's Aftermath.